Jimmy shouts, it's the season, Sartayas, two flayers for swerving no corners. We madness to moolah, living with Charlie's angels on us, no smiling with slime. All right, well, the young Turks, listen, we got a great show for you today, okay? I need you to calm down. No? Get excited. All right, bring it back down. All right, look, uh, we're going through waves today. Uh, can I tell you something? Here's uh, a segment that's going to be worth the price of admission today. Uh, over the weekend, I had a chance to break down what uh, Beck, Limbaugh, all these conservative talk show hosts, Fox News, was talking about with liberation theology. You know how they were always talking about that and payback and reparations? So w what are they driving at here? W what's going on? I mean, some of you might think, well, I know what they're driving at, but uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to give you Beck clips, I'm going to give you Limbaugh quotes, and I'm going to break it down for you, okay? Because now you know they're claiming that they uh, really represent Martin Luther King and that the civil rights leaders don't, and that they're the civil rights leaders are the racists, right? So we've talked a little bit about this before, but today, just a tutorial. You're going to see exactly what's going on. So a little bit later in the program. Also a little later in the program, uh, Sarah Palin. Um, oh, she stepped in it. That was awesome. Uh, first of all, she's going after a mosque. Second of all, she's uh, making up words. Ah, oh, the gift that keeps on giving. Okay. So that's coming up in a little bit. And then Tucker Carlson goes after Keith Olbermann. I might do that in the first segment. Who are you, Tucker Carlson? Who are you? All right, guys, just calm down. That's coming up, okay? Um, so n now let, let's start. Oh, wait a minute. What am I talking about? I got major news for you guys. <laughs> what the? Okay, not just one MSNBC appearance for weeks, now two. Last time we did a clip on this, people wanted the celebration sign sound effect, so you got it now. All right, so everybody knows Friday at 3 o'clock, every Friday at 3 o'clock, I'm coming. I'm coming on MSNBC. We're doing a regular segment, and, of course, the more people that watch, the better. Let's get those ratings up so we can get more and more appearances. That's what I was telling you last time, right? All of a sudden, instantly, next week, uh, we start, in fact, tomorrow we start uh, every Tuesday on the Dylan Radigan program. Uh, between 4.30 and 5. Here comes Jake. It's going to be a daily rant. I'm going to come. I'm going to bring the heat in the immortal words of Alan Grayson. I'm going to go on the offense, and I'm going to stay there. And that's the whole point of the segment. We go on the offense. We go on the attack. Okay? It, t tomorrow I'm going to start with a segment about how uh, tax cuts to the rich. I'm going to show you facts, numbers. As Ronald Reagan said, facts are stubborn things. Uh, about how tax cuts for the rich do not work. In fact, they turn out to be disastrous. Okay, so that's the first segment, but there will be many, many other segments where we attack many of the important issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I think there's going to be a little bit of this. I'm just saying, okay? And then perhaps a Kraken or two will be released. So every Tuesday between 4.30 and 5, I'm on the Dylan Radigan show on MSNBC, and every Friday at 3 o'clock I'll be part of their news programming uh, as well, doing some commentary. So if you guys can check out both of those, that would be Awesome. All right, now we keep on rolling. See what's here? He's too strong. Too strong. All right, I get excited. All right, so now uh, here's something, unfortunately, that uh, I, I, is not exciting. <laughs> it's slightly disastrous. Uh, but you know what? That's also about going on the attack, explaining to people what things are really about, right? So you know how yesterday, or at the end of last week, I came back, told you about financial reform. The bill, you know, got passed through the Senate and the House, uh, and then I wanted to see, look, what, what do some of the experts think about it? You know, I've got my own thoughts on it, but obviously there are people in the media that I trust, uh, there are experts, economists, etc., and even some senators, believe it or not, that I trust. So now in that group is Senator Feingold, and he voted no on it. He was the only Democrat who voted no. He just thought it's not redeemable. It, it's just too weak. It's not going to get the job done. And, and I'm not going to sign off on it. Okay, so now a, a lot of people complain about that, but I, I think I, I respect that a lot, right? If he thinks ultimately it's not going to work, what's the point? So now another guy I respect in this area is Senator Kaufman. He's the one that replaced Joe Biden. He's only there till November. He's worked on uh, in the Senate for over 30 years, right? So he's a veteran that he used to work for Biden. And now the reason I trust him is because he earned that trust. Uh, he gave speeches about uh, why it, we need to reform the system. He was exactly right about the root causes and how we should fix things, right? And then he introduced legislation that was terrific. Now that got voted down. 
So he wrote an article about why he voted for it and what to expect in the future. So I was like, okay, if Senator Kaufman is saying you know, that he should vote for it, I want to check it out. So I check it out. And here's basically what he said. Oh, this bill is so weak. He's like, but I guess I think it was the best we can do. So I'm voting for it. But the reason I'm writing this is to give you a warning. What we what we should have done is we should have made really clear rules about leverage, about derivatives, etc. And here are the bills we put in and that got voted down, etc. But as it is, we've left it all, so much of it up to the regulators. Now these are the same regulators he says in his article that failed us before. He's like, but I'm I'm hoping, of course, that they can do it right this time. But we've got to push them to get tougher and tougher. Now. And then here's why I'm bringing it to you, because Senator Kaufman had great details on some of the uh, points that we had problems with, right? So, for example, on the derivatives legislation, he says, look, they put a version of Blanche Lincoln's amendment in there, but that version is so weak that it hardly covers anything at all. In fact, 90% of the derivatives will stay exactly as they are. He's like, now, the regulators could get tougher and make sure that those other derivatives at least get reported, but you really got to stay on top of the regulars to, regulators to make sure that happens, right? So already you're like, oh boy. So we addressed maybe, hopefully, 10% of the problem, and the derivatives, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of experts, is the biggest problem, right? And then when you go to the Volcker rule, remember they said, oh, a small exception, just 3%, 3% of the capital that they have in the banks can go towards hedge funds where they invest their own money. Uh, and basically, they take your deposits, part of uh, certainly part of the capital they have is your deposits, and they use it to gamble, right? But they say, hey, don't for their own profits. But hey, don't worry though, we're only going to use three percent of our capital. He says, well, that sounds pretty reasonable, right? He's like, no. And he explains that three percent, like for for example, three billion dollars would actually turn into a hundred billion dollars because then they could raise other $97 billion to match their $3 billion, and they control the whole $100 billion fund, and then they might be able to borrow on top of that, because then they turn around and go, well, well now we've got $100 billion. And he says that would be larger than most of the hedge, large hedge funds combined right now. So again, it's an exception that com almost completely swallows the rule. So as he says he's voting for it, he's like, red flags, red flags, warnings, warnings. He said, look, he, th he says, if those regulators aren't super tough and they don't, you know, get all over these banks to control that risk and to use every possible leverage we gave them in enforcing tough rules, the system's going to crash again. Because just as I've been saying all along, the biggest money that the banks make is by taking the most amount of risk. That's just anybody who knows a thing about the finan financial world, economics, knows that's how it works. Now, what people will tell you is, don't worry, they won't take that risk, because then it might crash. But as we've explained a hundred times to you, no, they don't care if it crashes, because it's not their money, it's your money. They get to keep the profits that they take from risk, and you get to keep the losses. So after I read this, I thought, God bless Senator Kaufman for trying to make the bill uh, tougher, and I respect his decision to vote for it. But ultimately, if I was in the Senate, I'd have been with Senator Feingold. I would have voted no. Uh, this bill is just far too weak. And after I read it, I was like, oh, that we are in tremendous trouble. Okay, now, on the footsteps uh, steps of that, so we start, I, so I get that, and I'm like, oh, we, we need it uh, you know, to be tough regulators, right? And at the end of last week, I told you, the question is, are they going to have Elizabeth Warren as the head of the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau, right? And, of course, Tim Geithner's fighting against her, etc. So which way is it going to go? And, of course, the Obama apologist said, No, Jake, you don't understand. Elizabeth Warren, of course, she's got a very good chance. Of course they're going to appoint her. You know, you're just listening to articles that isn't true. Today, an article in The Hill, uh, Senator Dodd quotes in the paper, very, very clear, saying, Yeah, we really like Elizabeth Warren. I was like... Okay, she just might not be confirmable. Oh. Okay, so 
that's the what Democrats say when they don't want to confirm someone. They'll say, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, we would love to do it, but these damn Republicans. And because of the Republicans, we just, we just can't uh, confirm her, so we're going to give up. Uh, look, these are as clear a warning signs as you could possibly have. I don't know if that ship can be turned around, but if I had to predict today, I would definitely predict that they are not going to confirm or even try Elizabeth Warren. Now, you might say, hey, look, Jake, it's the numbers, it's the numbers. Why can't you understand? They don't have 60 votes. Scott Brown, he's the 41st senator. Except, and this is good news now, in another realm, the Disclose Act, the one that says, hey, you know what, if you're going to spend a lot of campaign, uh, co corporate money in campaigns, you have to disclose where that money came from. Now, it's a very vital bill, and I say, you know, compromise if you have to, et cetera, but get that thing passed, right? Now, of course, the Republicans who claim to be in favor of it are decided that they're against. No, no, no. Better yet, they're not against it. Olympia Snow, for example, the so-called moderate for Maine, says, no, 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 I, I guess I'm, no, I'm in favor of it. It's just I think there are other priorities, and I think we should uh, uh, wait and maybe get to it later. When he asked Susan Collins, the other so-called moderate from Maine, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, after the election we'll think about it. Okay, why? Republicans want to collect that corporate money before the election and probably after the election, right? And Scott Brown was already flipped on it and was like, you know, no, 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 of course not. We love corporate America. The Republicans plan to take an obscene amount of money from them. I mean, uh, it's a fine bill, but, you know, I've got some issues with it, la, 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 la. Okay, so that's in a world of trouble, right? But so why did I bring this, that up in this context? Because uh, Harry Reid is going to schedule a vote on it anyway. Now, wait a minute. I thought that if you don't have the votes, you don't have the votes. What are you doing, right? Well, Harry Reid thinks, and then other Democrats think, hey, you know what? This is a good issue to run on, right? So let's put Susan Collins and Olympia Snow and, and Scott Brown on the spot and tell the American people they're for corporate interests taking over the political system, which is true. Huh. All of a sudden, when you want to fight, when you want to get something done, you're not worried about what's doable and not doable. Well, you're not worried about the 60 votes. You just press ahead and you think, and they think, Harry Reid, et cetera, thinks, hey, you know what, if we put them on the spot, we just might get those 60 votes. Of course! The Republicans put the Democrats on the spot every time, whether it was the Iraq war, the tax cuts, or bank reform, uh, the <laughs> bank reform, of course not bank reform, uh, the ref bankruptcy reform where they didn't allow consumers to go bankrupt anymore. Okay. So that's a long story and an oversimplification, but uh, that was the essence of it. So the Republicans did it all the time, and now the Democrats, when they think it's politically advantageous, they do it. And in this case, I'm very glad they're doing it. But when they tell you, in other instances, like Elizabeth Warren, oh, no, no, we can't do that. Uh, she's unconfirmable. That means they never wanted her in the first place. <sighs> I'm telling you, man, some days I get so repulsed by the Democrats, I think... Uh, are, are, are some of them really any better than the Republicans? Look, the Ka Kaufmans of the world, the Feingolds of the world, the Frankers of the world, definitely much, much better than the Republicans. The Chris Dodds of the world? All right. So, but look, when we come back, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Sarah Palin, Tucker Carlson, and then I'm going to break down uh, the, uh, how they're trying to, uh, the conservatives are trying to trick Americans basically into hating Obama. That's part of the plan, at least. All right, come back, Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. So, over the weekend, I was looking at some, uh, unfortunately, conservative commentary, whether it was Glenn Beck, Rush Limbaugh, etc. And they keep coming back to certain themes. They're talking about black liberation theology, uh, and they're obsessed by it. And they're talking about reparations and payback and MLK and the civil rights leadership and the NAACP. So I, I wanted to give it a real airing and, and look at it and decide what are they trying to prove here, right? So I, I went through a lot of their tape and I've, I've picked out some things that I think are instructive here. And my sense of it, my conclusion is that uh, they're trying to prove that all of this stuff is connected to Obama and Obama wants to take white people's money. Okay, hold on. I'm going to show you the tapes. I'm going to show you exactly how they're going that way. And then, but there's a second part of it, which is that uh, Jesus wanted the rich people to keep all their money 
and not to redistribute it to anyone else. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, Glenn Beck is going to explain uh, what uh, Martin Luther King's dream really was and how he represents it, and Al Sharpton does not. Now look at uh, what he does with Al Sharpton's quote here, clip number one. Kind of scratching the surface of the civil rights movement, what is it? What was it? What is it really all about? Versus what progressives and radicals now want you to think it was all about. Let me show you how the movement in the 1960s has been perverted and distorted. You've got folks now like the Reverend Al Sharpton telling people that Martin Luther King's dream was really about redistribution of wealth. Here he is. Someone was saying to me the other day, Reverend Sharpton, we got an African-American president. We could achieve the dream of Dr. King. And I told him that was not Dr. King's dream. It's a great thing. I'm working with the president and supporting the president. But the dream was not to put one black family in the White House. The dream was to make everything equal in everybody's house. I, I don't remember that. Really? So he's saying that Al Sharpton, by saying that uh, we should make everybody equal, is actually saying we should take all the money in the country and split it up equally between everybody halves. Now, is that what you got out of that clip? No, of course. He was saying, hey, we should have equality, okay, which is what I think almost all Americans believe in. Not equality in results, equality in opportunity, right? Not just for one person, but for everybody. But Glenn Beck takes that and goes, aha, redistribution of wealth. Right? I know what MLK stood for, and these black folks don't. Right? Now, I, we've showed you numerous clips of Rush Limbaugh saying similar things. So, I mean, let's give you some Rush Limbaugh quotes to see if he represents uh, African Americans more than Al Sharpton, the NAACP, etc. Uh, first, he was talking to a caller once, and I found this to be the most instructive of all. Nobody ever talks about it, uh, and so I wanted to bring it to your attention one time. A caller calls in and says, um, is having a conversation with Limbaugh. Limbaugh says, look, there are two reasons. Um, I'm sorry. He says, uh, they want us to get out of Iraq, and, uh, but they can't wait to get us into Darfur, right? And the uh, caller says, right. Then Limbaugh continues and says, there are two reasons. What color is the skin of the people in Darfur? Caller, uh, yeah. It's a typical caller for Rush. And Rush continues, it's black. And who do the Democrats really need to keep voting for them? If they lose a significant percentage of this voting bloc, they're in trouble. Caller, yes, yes, the black population. Limbaugh, right, so you go into Darfur, you go into South Africa, you get rid of the white government there, you put sanctions on them, you stand behind Nelson Mandela, who was bankrolled by communists for a time, had the support of certain communist leaders, you go to Ethiopia, Ethiopia you hear, and you do the same thing. So here's Rush Limbaugh saying, ah, oh, they got rid of the good white government in South Africa and supported this no good communist Nelson Mandela, and why'd they do it? To appease the black population here in America. But don't worry, he represents civil rights better than the NAACP does, right? Now, if you're not convinced by that quote, well, we got a lot more where that came from. How about when Rush Limbaugh told the caller, take that bone out of your nose and call me back? That doesn't do it for you? How about when he said, have you ever noticed how all composite pictures of wanted criminals resemble Jesse Jackson? By the way, Rush, no, I have not noticed that. I know one of the criminals is a guy by the name of Rush Limbaugh, and he doesn't look anything like Jesse Jackson. And uh, if that weren't enough, one more. He said the NAACP should have riot rehearsal. They should get a liquor store and practice robberies. Gee, I wonder what... Rush Limbaugh and other conservative commentators think of black people in this country. But don't worry, they're out for your best interests. They represent MLK better than you guys do. So here's Glenn Beck. He's going to take a clip actually from our show where Michael Schur interviewed Julian Bond, who was the head of the NAACP at the time. And look at how he twists that around to make his same point, clip number two. Also, have the NAACP now telling um, everyone that King was a socialist. He said uh, the uh, NAACP came out, I don't know, this is about six months ago, saying that we, we wouldn't be celebrating Martin Luther King Day if we really knew who he was. Well, wait a minute, hang on just a second. Uh, help clear this up. Listen closely to what the chairman of the NAACP recently said. 
we, we don't remember the king who was the critic of capitalism, who, who said to uh, Charles Fager when they were in jail together in Selma in 1965 that he thought uh, a modified form of socialism would be the best system for the United States. Uh, we don't remember the Martin Luther King who um, talked ceaselessly about taking care of the, the masses and not just dealing with the people at the top of the ladder. Uh, so we've anesthetized him. We've, we've made him into a different kind of person than he actually was in life. And it may be that that's one reason he's so celebrated today, because we, we celebrate a different kind of man than really existed. But he was a bit more radical, not, not terribly, terribly radical, but a bit more radical than we make him out to be today. Hey, is that true? Was he a socialist? Was he a communist who was the guy? Now we have King starting to be painted as a radical. You know what? King was a radical. And just as Jesus was a radical. So what Beck is doing here is, no, 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 no. I'm not calling Martin Luther King uh, a communist. Uh, I'm on Martin Luther King's side. I'm on Jesus' side. These new civil rights leaders, they're the ones calling them radicals and socialists and communists because they want African Americans in the country to be socialist communists now, right? And he takes a, a quote of Julian Bond out of context there. And it, but even if you just watch that quote, it's painfully obvious that, if you, first of all, if you know the facts, Julian Bond's 100% right, that Martin Luther King cared a tremendous amount about poverty in the country. He thought that was one of the real injustices. He cared a lot about ending the Vietnam War, et cetera, et cetera. Things that the conservatives hated him for back then. And guess what they called Martin Luther King back then? A communist, right? But now, Beck says, no, 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 don't worry. King is on our side. He was for the rich, and et cetera. And these new civil rights leaders, they're the socialist the redistribution of wealth guys. Now, he's going to make it more obvious in the upcoming uh, uh, clips, and he's going to eventually tie it to Barack Obama. So let's go to clip number three here, where he talks about he's going to bring in social justice and whether Jesus was on you know, conservative side, liberal side, et cetera. I've taken a lot of hits from people like Reverend Jim Wallace on social justice. I spoke my mind on social justice because I needed you to know that there was a poison in many of our churches. This poison, I explained, is social justice the way Jim Wallace or Jeremiah Wright understands it. It isn't in the gospel. Redistribution of wealth is not in the gospel. Jesus never said, take from the rich. No. Jesus never said take from the rich. Jesus loved the rich. No, you're this social justice. You think Jesus was for social justice? No, no, no. Jesus and Martin Luther King are on Glenn Beck's side. They think you should keep all your money, right? It's curious because I got some quotes from Jesus, and I could do this all night long, but I'm going to give you three short ones, okay? Uh, first, let's, how about this one? But woe unto you that are rich. That's from Luke 6.24. Does that look like the Bible and the New Testament is on the side of the rich? But woe unto you that are rich. Interesting. Um, and then how about James 5.1? Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Does that sound like it's pro-rich against social justice? All right, and then, of course, everybody knows the famous one. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that's, of course, from Mark 10, 25. Okay. So, but don't worry, Glenn Beck's version of Jesus loves the rich and thinks you should keep your money. He's going to go on that theme in the next clip, and it's a great little twist on the grace of God. Let's go to that. Do you notice anything that is missing here? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, one, merit the idea of your character and merit. You earn certain things, but when it comes to salvation, what's missing? Grace. Grace. You're saved by grace. You cannot earn your way into heaven. You can't. There is no deed, no random act of kindness, no amount of money to spread around to others that earns you a trip to heaven. It can't happen. It's earned by God's grace alone. Oh, I love that one. What's he saying to you there? No, no kindness is going to help you. 
It's just up to God, God's grace. So don't give any money to anybody. Jesus didn't want that. Don't do random acts of kindness. Jesus didn't want that. He wanted to hoard you, you to hoard your money and then say, well, it's up to the grace of God. What can I do? In the beginning, he said, look, I earned my money. I, I earned it. I get to keep it, okay? Jesus told me I could keep the money. So did Martin Luther King. Okay. So now we're going to start to connect it to Obama. Uh, he's, and this is all going to work with liberation theology, etc. Let's go to the next clip. Now, Cohn himself has argued that the Bible is insufficient to know what social justice is. Do you know why? Because social justice isn't in the Bible. That's awesome. He says you need Marxism to understand what Christianity means. Now, I have to tell you, I don't think, and I think most Christians will agree with me, that Karl Marx speaks for God. I don't think so. Well, what do you say we 86 marks here? Thanks, but no thanks. All right. So now he's taking James Cohn, who he claims is the leader of liberation theology. Uh, it may be my bad. I haven't heard of the guy before, right? And he played a bunch of his clips. And then he says, you see, liberation, black liberation theology, black, black, black liberation theology equals Marxism, social justice, redistribution of wealth. No, 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 Jesus didn't want any of that. Jesus wanted you to keep your money. <laughs> Woe unto you that is rich. That was a typo. That was a typo, okay? So now here comes the ultimate goal. Connect Obama to the Marxists who are for social justice, etc. Let's go to the last clip. Let me bring this now to Barack Obama. Hmm, really? I will play some audio here, lots of audio of Barack Obama talking about individual salvation. His individual salvation depends on collective salvation. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, according to liberation theology, it means that salvation and redemption bought by Jesus comes in the form of political and social liberation for minorities from white oppression. Salvation is realized with minorities achieving economic and political parity via redistribution of wealth with whites. Minorities are saved in the sense that white people constantly confess and repent of being racist and meet the economic demands of minorities via the redistribution of wealth as a consequence of, of uh, in some form or another, reparations. There it is. See, this is why I went back and looked at all these clips, because Limbaugh talks about this, Beck talks about it, all the conservative commentators talk about it. They all mention the same words, redistribution of wealth, reparations, payback. They connect it to this liberation theology, etc., in an effort to connect it back to Obama. What does it equal at the end? He's saying, because these guys believe in social justice, what they want to do and what Barack Obama wants to do is to take white people's money and spread it around to the black people. That's the redistribution of wealth. That's what Rush Limbaugh calls payback. That's what they all call reparations. Has Obama talked about reparations at all? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Not even anywhere near it, right? But it doesn't matter because some other black guy who believes in liberation theology once talked about it, and, I'm, and he's black and Obama's black, and so I'm going to put them all together, and I'm going to say, you see that? They want social justice, and they want to take all your white money and give it to black people. But why would anybody ever think they're racist? No, no, no. They're on the side of civil rights. You know, what's weird is that, though, during the civil rights era, conservatives in this country as I recollect, were deeply against civil rights. In fact, they filibustered civil rights, the actual bill itself, to make sure that blacks and whites did not have the same rights. It's funny how now all of a sudden they claim the opposite. But are they really? And when you look at the message here, and you will see, this is the beginning, you will see this over and over and over. Understand what they're saying. It's not very complicated, as you see the clips. What they're saying to their audience is Obama is a black guy who wants to steal your white money. And it's sickening, it's perverse, and is it racist? Hell yes it's racist. It couldn't be any more racist. And you saw it there right for, for yourselves. Young Turks. Alright, back on the Young Turks. Um, now, we go back to uh, domestic politics. Uh, we uh, had an issue with the Tea Party folks and the NAACP. There was a little beef last week. 
uh, where the NAACP said, look, there are some people within the Tea Party movement uh, that brought racist signs, said racist things to congressmen, uh, etc., and we were hoping that the Tea Party can rein those guys in. Not to say that they're, uh, all the Tea Party people are like that, but some are, so uh, they were considering a resolution uh, on that count. Now, you have to really give it to the NAACP here because they found a way to really focus people on that issue. It, it, because then the Tea Party so-called representatives came out and they blew up over and they started calling the NAACP racist and on and on it went and it became this giant national issue that the media ate up. So in a lot of ways, mission accomplished for the NAACP, right? Got people to talk about that issue and consider uh, the ramifications. So one of the guys who uh, really shot back at the NAACP was Mark Williams. He's the, uh, the head of the Tea Party Express. I always find the names amusing. Apparently, it turns, it turns out there's a Tea Party Federation that they all belong to. It sounds a little like the WWE, right? So Mark Williams came out and called NAACP just about everything you could. Uh, on Friday's uh, program, we showed you all those clips. But then what really broke the camel's back was a letter that he wrote pretending to be Ben Jealous, the head of the NAACP, to Abraham Lincoln. And he kept saying things like, uh, well, I can give you some quotes here. Uh, Dear Mr. Lincoln, he's written, writing to Abraham Lincoln in his mind, we coloreds have taken a vote and decided that we don't cotton to that whole emancipation thing. Freedom means having to work for real, think for ourselves, and take consequences along with the rewards. That is just far too much to ask of us colored people, and we demand that it stop. And it went on and on like that. We shared it with you on Friday. Now, we asked the question, okay, how is this guy not racist, right? I mean, you read the whole letter, he's pretending to speak for black people, and it was the most offensive thing that I've seen in a while, really, in the press. Keep calling you know, them, them colored, saying that they really want flat screen TVs, and they want to take white people's money, and it went on and on and on. And then we had a Tea Party leader on this program, the head of the Institute of Liber for Liberty, and he said Mark Williams was idiotic and that he doesn't speak for everybody. And uh, it turns out, yeah, we were kind of right. Everybody is outraged by this letter and realized this Mark Williams isn't doing anybody any good. And there he goes overboard. So here's a little report uh, on uh, what has happened. Now, this David Webb, who's going to be talking about it, he's with the Tea Party Federation which the Tea Party Express plays it. Okay, so, or used to play it. Let's watch. If you look selectively, you, Bob, can find, you know, single examples in any movement. There are fringe elements. Dale Robertson has been discredited and has been denounced and is not a Tea Party member. Mark Williams is not a Tea Party leader, although he's perceived as such by some in the media and by uh, Mr. Jealous. Well, it, it does seem to me that, uh, that uh, part of what this is about is, is he's saying to you, you really need to police uh, your, your organization and uh, that uh, some of these signs, we've seen them that have shown up at some of these parties, really are objectionable. Uh, what are you doing about that? Well, well we have, and uh, that's a very good question. We, in the last 24 hours, have expelled Tea Party Express and Mark Williams from the National Tea Party Federation because of the letter that he wrote, which he, I guess, may have considered satire, but which was clearly offensive. And that is what we do. Self-policing is the right and the responsibility of any movement or organization. I denounce any acts that I see. Many leaders do. Oh, no! Mark Webb off the top rope! Elbow from the sky to Mark Williams, or whatever their names are. Mark Williams is out. He has been expelled from the Tea Party Federation. Who's the guy that expelled him? Who was the guy we were just looking at? David Webb. Sorry. Okay. David Webb drops the lug on him. By the way, Hulk Hogan, the biggest wrestler of all time, with the single worst wrestling move ever made, dropping the leg. I mean, come on, the sleeper hold, or the off the top rope, or the people's elbow. I don't know, come on, give me something, drop the leg. Anyway, so they drop the leg on Mark Williams, he's out. Mark Williams doesn't believe it, he says, no, 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 I'm the real leader of the Tea Party movement, I expel them! <laughs> no, he didn't say that, but that would be fun. But he did say that this has become, uh, quote, a world wrestling style personality conflict with me in the middle. 
uh, what's great about the Tea Party guys is they're so angry and usually rudderless that they love to get mad at each other, too. Remember the blow-up they had over Sarah Palin? One of the, the Tea Party patriots or the Tea Party cults, I don't know, uh, invited her over and gave her $100,000. And then the Tea Party Steelers left, and then the Tea Party Ravens came in, and they were all upset, and some of them were, and then they went to war, and then they sued each other. So it's... It's funny to watch this thing unravel. They're like, you're not real Tea Party. I'm Tea Party. You're not Tea Party. You're expelled. <laughs> okay. So they're, they're falling apart at the seams here a little bit. Um, so, but you look, if this David Webb guy really represents the Tea Party Federation, I mean, I don't know if that's wrestling or if that's like Star Trek. Okay. We have expelled the Kardashians from our Federation. <laughs> the Kardashians. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So... Uh, well, that's a good thing, though, because his letter was incredibly offensive, and and, he sh and if they want to prove they're not racist, well, that's the best way to do it, to say this guy's not one of us, even though he claims to be one of the Tea Party leaders. And, so, okay, I I'm going to actually score one for the Tea Party if this guy is for real, if David Webb is for real and, and Mark Williams has had the sleeper hold applied to him. Okay, uh, so, now the other part of this that's interesting is, you know, you notice what's happening here? Hey, let's keep it real, okay? This is what they used to do to Democrats. Okay, look, this is what TYT does, okay? We're totally honest with you. Remember when they would pull people in and they go, you know, Howard Dean said this. What do you think about that, huh? And then they'd all be like, oh, damn. Okay, oh, I hate Howard Dean. Howard Dean's a pain in my ass. And Okay, you win. Here goes Howard Dean under the bus, right? Now, back in the day, I mean, we agree with Howard Dean, and he never really said anything crazy, but they, you know, drum it up. Or Dick Durbin, he said that some of our, we were using former Soviet gulags. But we were! <laughs> okay, I mean, that's a fact, right? But then they made him cry like a bitch. He came out in the center floor. <laughs> I didn't mean to hurt the troops. You didn't hurt the troops. You said that about the administration. Anyway, you know how Democrats are. But so when you do it to Republicans or conservatives, it's a fascinating thing to behold. I mean, they feel like, hey, wait a minute, this isn't quite fair. But at the same time, now they're throwing each other under the bus. It's an old trick, and it's interesting to see it flipped on conservatives. I hadn't seen that in a while. Now, look, they're going to do it to Mitch McConnell. Um, Candy Crowley is going to ask him on CNN, how about these Tea Party folks? Let's watch. Number nine. Do you think that there are racist elements in the Tea Party? Oh my goodness! In, in the whole country, oh my uh, is there racism? Well, as you as you know, this week the NAACP said that the uh, tea, there know, are racist I, elements I, in the Tea Party. I'm not interested in getting into that debate. What we're interested in is uh, trying to have an election this fall that will respond to what the American people are asking us to do, which is to have some checks and balances here. They've seen big government on full display here for a year and a half. They are appalled. They would like for it to stop. And the best way for it to stop is to have a mid-course correction, which is not unusual in American politics, and I'm hoping that's what's coming this fall. Nothing that you've seen on TV, including some of the signs that we've seen, I'll be at the minority at some of these Tea Party rallies, uh, some of the posters that have put, been put up in the name of some factions of the Tea Party make you the least bit uncomfortable? Look, there, there are all kinds of things going on in America that make me uncomfortable, both on the right and on the left. I've got better things to do than to wait, wait in to all of these disputes and discussions that are going on out in the country, what we're trying to do is to make the president a born-again moderate. We're trying to, <laughs> to send enough uh, conservatives to Congress this November to move him in a different direction. All right. Uh, by the way, Mitch McConnell plays for the Tea Party goblins. <laughs> okay. In, in all seriousness, this is, I'm going to declare it right here, totally unfair to Mitch McConnell. Okay, now you know I am no fan of Mitch McConnell. Uh, I think he's wrong on everything he's stated and everything he stands for. He's, he's with the big bankers. I don't have to tell you about all that, right? But Mitch McConnell's main guy in Kentucky was running against the Tea Party guy, in which in this case was Rand Paul. You remember? And Rand Paul took down Mitch McConnell's right-hand man. So why does Mitch McConnell have to answer for a sign that was put up at a Tea Party protest however many months ago? Now, come on, that's not fair, okay? I mean, he, he, Mitch McConnell's got a lot to answer for, but the Tea Party signs 
aren't one of them. One, because he can't possibly control those signs. Uh, and number two, it's because he's actually not a Tea Party guy at all. He's an establishment Republican, and some of the main things that the Tea Party guys are angry at, to be fair to them. J.R. Well, they asked Denny Hoyer about it, too, and he's a Democrat. And he just said, well, yeah, these things happen. I saw this at this event. This happened at this event. This guy said this. Answer the question if it's true or not, but he's still afraid to do it, which means he's trying to cater to everything still. He's still trying to be inclusive to that group of people because he wants those votes. That's all. His answer said it right then. Uh, I'm not worried about that stuff. That's going to get me in trouble. All I'm worried about is getting elected this upcoming election. She asked him again, you know what? I'm not going to talk about that because that's going to hurt me. It's yeah, I know, but you see, that's the thing. And I hear you, JR, cause it, but they're putting him in a tough spot because they're putting him in a spot where he has to speak out against some people who might support him, who might give votes for him and his party, right? On the other hand, you're right that, hey, well, that's life in the big city, so answer the question. I mean, if I was Mitch McConnell, here's how I would have answered it. Ken, are you really asking me about signs that somebody else put up in a rally that I, you know, had nothing to do with uh, nine months ago? Oh, of course I don't control those signs. Am I in favor of racist signs? I'm going to be bold here on CNN and say no. But that doesn't characterize a lot of the Tea Party people across the country, and I agree with most of their substantive policy positions. Now, I think that's the right way to answer it, right? But they're politicians. They're ghouls. They're goblins. So they're scared. So, and he just got his ass handed to him by the Tea Party guys in Kentucky, where his main guy got taken down, right? So he's scared to death of the Tea Party guys. And that's why he gives you that answer. So that's the reality of the game that's being played. All right. Uh, now, uh, we, they're going to challenge him on real stuff now. Uh, and they're challenging a lot of Republicans on this. I think actually surprisingly doing a good job, uh, the media is in challenging them on this. Let's go to uh, Candy Crowley, still with Mitch McConnell, uh, but this time they're going to talk about spending, unemployment, et cetera. Let's go to clip number 11. I want to play a little bit more about what the president had to say uh, yesterday when he really was slamming uh, Republicans for standing in the way of this extension of unemployment benefits. Take a listen. They say we shouldn't provide unemployment insurance because it costs money. So after years of championing policies that turned a record surplus into a massive deficit, including a tax cut for the wealthiest Americans, they finally decided to make their stand on the backs of the unemployed. Look, we're talking about $34 billion to extend that employment to the long-term unemployed, to give them more weeks of unemployment benefits. Doesn't he have a point? I mean, why in the world would you choose to take this stand? I mean, the deficit's a trillion dollars this year. So for $34 billion, it's going to help people with no jobs. You all are standing in the way of it. Well, the budget is over a trillion dollars, too. And somewhere in the course of spending a trillion dollars, we ought to be able to find enough to pay for a program for the unemployed. We're, we're all for extending unemployment insurance. The question is, when are we going to get serious, Candy, about the debt? We recently passed a $13 trillion cumulative deficit threshold. When? Are we going to get serious about this? This administration has been on a, an incredible well, spending that spree. Point, and I understand what you're saying, and I think the American people are concerned mm -hmm. about the deficit spending. Uh, but you all, uh, when Republicans were in charge six of the eight years that President Bush was here, you were a majority leader at times during that. Uh, you spent on a prescription drug bill that was not paid for, that is far more expensive than this unemployment uh, bill is. You had two wars, ongoing wars that were not paid for. So for you now to stand up and say, well, we're for balancing the budget, and by the way, you've got to pay for these unemployment benefits, it just seems dissonant to the <clears throat> trials of the American people, particularly those without jobs. Well, let's put it in perspective. The last year of the Bush administration, the deficit as a percentage of gross domestic product was 3.2 percent, well within the range of what most economists think is manageable. A year and a half later, it's almost 10 percent. But you, you know, didn't how, many, how then, long can the it... how, how long can the other side run against the previous administration? They've been in charge now for a year and a half. Well, the issue is not whether the public uh, thought Republicans uh, spent more than they should have. The issue is when do we stop doing this? Did you spend more than you should have as Republicans? Look, if you put it in comparison, as I just pointed out. We've been on a gargantuan spending spree for the last year and a half, far more than any uh, deficits that were run up in the early part of the decade. This is, this is a serious matter. At what point do we pivot 
and do something about this. And we think if you can't pay for a program that everybody agrees we ought to extend, what are we going to pay for? All right. See, that I love because that was substantive uh, questions to Mitch McConnell. And, you know, he did his best in answering them. Of course, he was misleading, uh, grossly misleading. For example, he says, look, now uh, the budgets are, the deficits are slated to be 10% of our GDP. Uh, it, Obama has done all this spending in the last year and a half. No. He was left with a $1.2 trillion deficit to begin with, with, which Mitch McConnell is conveniently now saying is Obama's deficit. Now, th we had to spend more money on top of that, but to give that to Obama is just 100 percent wrong. That was Bush's. That was uh, left over for Obama administration. He says, oh, I don't want to go into the past. The past is ugly. That's when we were in charge and we screwed things up and left this gigantic deficit. Now, on top of that, why did Obama do more spending? Stimulus spending. Now, why did he have to do stimulus spending? Because he wanted to? No, we were in a giant recession. We're still in a giant recession. Now, is that Obama's fault? I, look, you know I'm tough on Obama and other things, but that is not Obama's fault. That's definitely Bush and McConnell's fault who got us into that mess in the first place. But the heart of what Candy Crowley's asking is even better. She's saying, well, how come when Republicans were in charge, we didn't have to pay for anything? You didn't have to offset it. You didn't have to increase taxes. You didn't have to reduce spending. You want a war? Great. Don't pay for it. Iraq, Afghanistan, great. The prescription drug bill, that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Remember during the health care reform, everybody was like, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Is it deficit neutral? And it turns out it actually saves money from, the, it reduces the deficit, right? But during the prescription drug bill, no, 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 there you go. Okay, we didn't hear a word about it, right? It's, so why this disparity? And if you notice, McConnell did not have an answer for that. He never came back and explained why the Republicans never had to pay for anything, but as soon as the Democrats get in charge, oh, no, 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 that has to be paid for. And then when you ask him, well, so how are you going to pay for it? Are you going to raise taxes? He says, no, my God, no, 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 don't raise taxes. And so he says, oh, we're all for, uh, you know, unemployment benefits. Well, that's, again, empirically incorrect. No, you're not. You're against unemployment benefits. In fact, you just filibustered it. The reason we don't have extended unemployment benefits, right or wrong, is because you killed it. So don't come on CNN and tell me that you're for it when you're dead set against it. That's the fundamental dishonesty. So now, continuing in that line, uh, Representative Pence is going to be on with Chris Wallace uh, of Fox News. And actually, Chris Wallace is going to ask him very good questions. Let's go to clip number 10. There is, Congressman Pence, a big vote, perhaps this week, coming up on whether to extend unemployment benefits. Republicans say it must be paid for. Here is the president's response. I've got no problem spending money on tax breaks for folks at the top who don't need them and didn't even ask for them. But they object to helping folks laid off in this recession who really do need help. Congressman Pence, why is it that extending unemployment benefits has to be paid for, according to Republicans, but extending the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy, which would cost $678 billion, that doesn't have to be paid for? Well, well let me say, look, uh, Republicans, me included, have supported numerous extensions of, of unemployment benefits, and we're anxious to do so again. Yeah. Uh, but, but look, the, the, American, uh, the, the deficit this year is a trillion dollars for the second year in a row and more. The American people have had it with, with runaway federal spending, deficits and debt, and they want to begin to see men and women in Washington, D.C., begin to make the hard choices and, but, and but, prioritize but, spending. But, now, but, and but the sir, other part of it, too, I, I, you're is... not answering my question. I, I can understand the argument, mm -hmm. yeah. pay for the unemployment benefits. Why th then not pay for the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy? Well, uh, I, I think the reality is that as you study when President Kennedy uh, 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 cut marginal tax rates, when Ronald Reagan cut marginal tax rates, when President Bush imposed those tax cuts, they actually generated economic growth. They expand the economy. They expand tax but revenue. But the deficit still grew. And so the way, well, the, the, the deficit grew under, under the Reagan administration and the Bush administration for different reasons, and it had a lot to do with spending. The reality is during the Reagan years, for instance, we doubled the amount of revenue that we were sending to Washington, D.C. after the tax cuts took effect. Okay, look, got to give credit to Chris Wallace for uh, really trying to pin him down on that. Uh, again, he's like, oh, we voted for unemployment benefits many times, and we're anxious to do it again. 
Well, if you were anxious to do it again, one way would do it would be to do it, to vote for it, <laughs> instead of vote against it, instead of filibustering it. Filibustering something doesn't really give send a signal that you're anxious to do it, right? Uh, and then if you notice, he slipped a little thing in there about we've had a trillion dollar over trillion dollar deficit two years in a row. Really, who was in charge of the year before? Oh, right, Bush was. But he makes it seem like oh, I don't, you know, two years in a row, Obama, you know. No, 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 not Obama. You know, you were in charge one of those years. You're the one who left him a trillion dollar deficit. They don't want to spend uh, money on the unemployed because that's not their base. Their base is the people who get them elected is the people who give them money. And the people who give the Republican Party money is the richest people in the country. So you will never get them to say, hey, you know what, maybe we should increase taxes a little bit for the rich. It, they will say, no, under no circumstances can you tax the rich. Again, on tomorrow's Dylan Radigan program, at around the 4.30 mark, I'm going to tell you how tax cuts uh, for the rich uh, and tax increases for the rich have worked throughout the history of the United States. Do they make sense? Do they not make sense? I'll give you a teaser. When we tax the rich at really high rates, we have enormous economic expansion. When we don't tax them very much and they keep a huge percentage of the national income, we have recessions and depressions. Okay, so this idea, the Republican idea, that if we just give all the money to the rich, everything's going to be fine, is disastrously wrong. All right, and that's what they won't admit. So now, one more. We're going to go to Representative Pete Sessions uh, on Meet the Press, and David Gregory is going to ask him, all right, all right, now you see you won't cut taxes for the, uh, I'm sorry, you won't raise taxes for the rich. You won't do this, you won't do that. What will you do? How would you balance the budget? Good questions. Let's see how it gets answered. I think what a lot of people want to know is, if Republicans do get back into power, what are they going to do? It's quite simple that the American people do understand the agendas that are before us. They understand what the president and the speaker stand for, and they understand what Republicans stand for. Republicans, and especially our candidates, who are all over this country, very strong standing with the American people back home. We need to live within our own means. And certainly the projections that are ahead, including health care and the projections for unemployment for a long time and debt, for as far as we can see, is staggering. We need to live within our own means. Secondly, we need to make sure that we read the bills. These bills are so bad, which is why we don't have a budget that is being looked at. Now, the 2011 budget is staggering in terms of taxes and the, the discipline that is lacking from this House uh, Democratic leadership to even debate and bring the bill for the budget and appropriations to the floor is a lack well, of leadership. And lastly, that, that's, a pre, that's a pretty gauzy agenda so far. I mean, what, specific, what painful choices are Republicans prepared to make? Are they going to campaign on repealing health care, for instance, repealing financial regulation? Would you just like to see those two things done? Well, first of all, let's go right to it. We're going to balance the budget. We should live within our own means, and we should read the bills and work with the American people. How do you people. do it? Tell me how you do it. Name a painful choice that Republicans are prepared to say we ought to make. Well, first of all, we uh, need to make sure that as we look at uh, all that we are spending in Washington, D.C., with not only the, en the entitlement spending, but also uh, the bigger government we cannot afford anymore. We have to empower the free enterprise system. See, this is where... Congressman, these are not specific. Oh, they are. Voters get, get they, tired they, of that. They, you want to deal with entitlement spending. Will you are. raise the retirement age on Social Security? Let, Will you let, cut benefits at Social Security? Let's go Will right. you repeal health care? Let's go right to it. Do it. And Chris talked right about it. He wants to diminish employers' abilities to be able to be competitive across this world. We need to make sure that we allow employers, which was in that 52-page report that was presented to the President of the United States by CEOs in this country, we need to go back to the exact same agenda that is empowering the free enterprise system rather than diminishing. Senator, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing right. an answer here on specific what painful choices to really deal with the deficit. <laughs> Let's get right to it. Uh, I want to live within our means. All right, how are we going to do that? Let's get right to it. Within our means, balance the budget. Okay, that's fine, but how are we going to balance the budget? Let's get right to it. Uh, empower uh, the free enterprise system. Okay, great. How are we going to empower the free enterprise system? Let's get right to it. Live within our means. <laughs> At the end, my sense was that he never really got to it. Okay, it's because he doesn't want to say, hey, you know what, 
uh, yeah, of course, we're going to raise the retirement age on Social Security, and we're going to hose you big time. And we're going to make you work longer, and then we're going to cut your Social Security benefits, we're going to cut your Medicare benefits, and uh, are we going to raise taxes on the rich? Hell no. They pay our bills, man. We're going to raise, in essence, we're going to take away money from the middle class, from the poor folks in the country, from all of you who are suffering, and we're going to give it to the rich. So let's get right to it. <laughs> That's what it is. And he doesn't have the cojones to say it on national TV. He wants to, oh, the, that's why the code words. We want to empower the free enterprise system. That means I want to empower my really rich friends by taking your money and giving it to them. Okay. So, and how do we know they're not going to balance the budget? Because they never balanced it when they were in power. They never even tried. When did the budgets blow up? First, under Ronald Reagan. When did they get balanced? Under Bill Clinton. When did they blow up again? Under George Bush. Are you seeing a pattern here? Okay. Because once they get in power, then you don't have to pay for anything. Yeah, tax cuts for the rich, great. Wars for the military industrial complex, great. Now, one uh, further thing on this. Do you no notice that the media all of a sudden is asking all these tough questions to the Republicans? So what happened? What happened was Obama made the case. Did you notice they played Obama clips in all of those? And Obama came out and said, hey, look, they don't want to pay for unemployment benefits, uh, but they're willing to pay for tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, right? Or they're not willing to pay for it either, but they want to take it, right? And so what does the media do? Media follows power. And that's why when Obama tells you, oh, I'm powerless, oh, the Republicans have 60 votes, oh, I can't do it, no, not Elizabeth Warren, I can't do that public option, no, I can't do that, I can't do any of these things, right? Oh, but that's because you're not trying. Look at what happens when you do try. All of a sudden, it looks like you can get a lot of things done. All of a sudden, this whole weekend, because of Obama going on the offense, Republicans were playing on defense, and they couldn't do it. And then when the media pressed them on it, they had no answers, because they're not used to getting pressed on it. Will you, for the love of God, go on the offense and stay there? And by the way, not just during election time. How about next time we do it when we're actually trying to pass a bill where you lay out your own case for your own side and put them on the defensive? Young Turks. Rosanna.